everyone and welcome to a I think it's safe to say a scholarly academics and comics focused episode of words images and worlds delighted to be joined on this episode by Dr. Neil Cohn. Dr. Cohn thank you for jumping in and joining me today. Well thank you for having me it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm assuming I pronounced that correctly with the long that o. is correct yes okay like a geometric Fantastic. Fantastic. I always enjoy when I have um, academics and scholars on the show. We also have a variety of young adult, middle grades, and comics creators. So just highlighting the world of literacy, the world of comics, and I greatly appreciate the work that you've done. I'm going to say the name. I was reading your bio on your website, so I'm going to say the name Todd McFarlane. Uh, <laughs> you you yeah. are connected to this person in some way? Uh, I was. Um, when I was a teenager, I worked for Todd McFarlane for several years. Before working specifically for Todd, I worked for Image Comics generally for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and then my contact moved over to work with Todd, and so I moved with them. And um, yeah, I spent my summers essentially working at Comic-Con International in San Diego for Todd McFarlane Productions. And it was kind of like my uh, annual comics boot camp uh, as I was... Uh, and very quickly became kind of on the inside of the industry where I uh, I started working for Image at age 14. So I was uh, very young starting out uh, with them. And I worked uh, for them until I was uh, 20, I think was the last time, if I recall correctly. It's not a bad summer job at all. It's pretty good. It was all. pretty fun. I looked forward to it all year. There was talk at one point of sending me on the road with like the like the spawn truck or something and then but it never, it, for a summer but it didn't happen and it ended up not happening nice nice and, and we were talking before the recording we both grew up and lived uh and continue to live in a, a particular time in comics because uh, i think it was 1988 or 89 when i really got connected to comics and that was of course through the world of dc detective comics batman the tim burton film and then on into the 90s with so many trends and things that happened in pop culture in the 90s. Um, so uh, any formative works that you want to mention before we talk a little bit about your your research trajectory and how how you... Sure. How I, I think this with direction. an eye to that, uh, that research trajectory, I think growing up in that era was um, very formative because a lot of things happened at once. It was such a time period where... Um, you had a, a great diversity of, of things happening. So the creator's uh, rights movement became very in full front and center with the creation of image. So suddenly, uh, you know, this the notion of the artist driving the show a little bit more uh, became very salient. You also had the influx of manga at the same time. You had kind of the rising uh, notions of graphic novels and graphic novel publishing at the same time. Um, as you know, all of these sorts of things that are now very prominent and uh, a part of the landscape of at least American comics very saliently, uh, we're all starting around that same time period when I was first getting into comics and working for Image and things like that. And that I think very much shaped the way you know that I think about a lot of these issues. Like so, my within the study of comics that I've done to transition for you a little bit there. Uh, I've always focused both on, you know, a, a kind of inclusive vision of this. So it's not like I'm just talking about the narrow range of comics that people think of as the canon. It's I, I'm thinking about just the principles of, you know, of creating in sequential images or sequential images plus, plus text uh, and a theory that would be applicable both to you know American comics and to manga and to bande dessinée and in a global scope, because I was exposed to all those things at that time, it was very clear that all that was needing to be accounted for. And then I was going to mention um, who understands comics, which is one of the more recent texts, and you have an entire chapter in there that just sort of dives into manga. And uh, I, I learned a lot not being a person who uh, read a lot of manga uh, or has read a lot of manga over the years. And so just to just to, with that one example alone, the complexities that you pull out and the, the trends and the approaches are really fascinating. Yeah. Well, actually, if I, if I can immediately go into a short plug, which is that yes. in Understands Comics, the chapter you're referring to is my kind of analysis of 
this annotation we did of like 300 something odd comics uh, where we looked at the different structures involved with them. Uh, and in Who Understands Comics, I then just a couple bits of that data set uh, in that one chapter. I actually have another book coming out in December that is that is the entire book is interrogating this corpus of 350 comic 350 plus comics uh, across numerous different structures so every chapter is a different you know there's one whole chapter on page layout and all the differences in, that arise in page layouts across these uh 13 different uh, uh countries that we looked at um okay. and uh you know these sorts of things like you know there's a whole chapter on storytelling there's a whole chapter on uh, framing structure of panels and things like that so it's a, even more of a deep dive into those sorts of details uh, and that's coming out in like december the book is called uh the patterns of comics Some awesome is that the manuscript you just finished or was that no that's know. actually a different manuscript okay. that's <laughs> nice. yet another manuscript the one i i just finished with my colleague uh Josh Kilprod, is about multimodality and it's about a um uh, basically what is demanded of a cognitive architecture in order to have multimodal expressions like the combinations of text and, and pictures or speech and gestures like I'm doing right now. And how, how does that all come together? Because typically people just talk about things as if there is, well, there's speech and language over here and that's its own architecture. And then there's this other stuff that's pictures and words and uh, pictures and gestures and things like that. But our approach is to actually say, well, in order to have them being able to combine with each other, it's actually one system. Um, and the, the different parts are actually just sub parts of that one system. So we have a extensive discussion of what that system is like, and that will be out probably this time next year. So spring 2024. So a lot of books coming soon. Actually. And, and I'll mention uh, for folks that want to read more, you, you're rather prolific. You have a variety of <laughs> articles that are out which i appreciate you have uh, a number of books uh i'll mention the visual language of comics as well um, and then you have the visual language lab website which sort of houses links to uh, many of your articles or at least the the citations so that people can find out more yeah yeah actually all of my articles are provided on my website so either as pdfs or links to open access uh uh articles so they all they should all be there wonderful wonderful and, and thanks for taking the extra steps to make those available because that's one of the one of the pieces with the academic writing that i find uh a little frustrating is you run into those paywalls and and yeah. things of that nature and it it's actually good to disseminate from my side it actually was something i was doing from the very beginning uh so i started writing about this stuff right out of my bachelor's uh, is when I first was writing my initial papers about visual language theory. And I didn't know that I was, you know, supposed to be submitting to journals and things like that. You know what? I, I, I don't know. I don't. So um, I, uh, in being very enterprising as I was, I, but even back then, made a website. This was, I don't want to date myself, but this was like 2002, had my mm -hmm. own website. And I would post PDFs onto it of my writings. Um, and so for a long time, it was just, my website was all these PDFs of the writings that I had done. And then eventually I was like, oh, I should, you know, I get into grad school and stuff. And I was like, oh, I should be, you know, publishing papers into, into actual journals. And then so I, I slowly started like taking down the, what we would now call preprints and then put up the actual um, journal articles. And at some point it just kind of shifted over entirely. Um, but I basically was always doing that. That was back when like, I had to like, you know, strain to reduce PDF file sizes back then because it wasn't mm -hmm. quite as readily <laughs> a thing. But yeah, I basically ever since, you know, I, I started doing this work, I have been posting my work online for everybody. So that's part of my, my main you know, thrust of things is to, make things at least accessible to people um uh, yeah i appreciate that i also appreciate how you position comics um because there are people that do exclusively comic scholarship but you have a phd in psychology yes uh, so you look you look at the cognitive approach to visual literacy and language uh, from not only the comics perspective, but within a wider corpus of film media. And you mentioned multimodality with gestures. And so it's it's nice for people to think about 
texts in that way and the way that we communicate. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes there's still that resistance to the legitimacy of comics, which is something that I try to push back against in, in the States. That's, that doesn't seem to be as much of a question in other parts of the world yeah. um, with Bon Dissonne, but yeah. um, definitely a, a conversation that still happens in some ways here. Yeah. Yeah. I guess um, for listeners who are not familiar with my work, I should probably just say what I, what I do a little bit, which is that um, essentially, uh, you know, a lot has been written about you know, the structures that go into how we speak and and, and how we communicate verbally. Um, and less so has been done about the structures that we use in order to draw. Um, and that's how I would basically strip it down to what I study is, what are the structures involved with how we draw? How do those structures also contribute, you know, combine with the structures of how we write, uh, for example, which is really just a, a conversion of the structures of how we speak into the graphics. So you know, writing is literally drawing sounds. So um, you know that the native uh, 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 expressions in that is drawings. The, the the speech is the unnatural part, or so the writing is unnatural. Um, but we don't really focus that much on the structure of drawings as if they don't actually have something going on there. And so. Um, you know, comics are a primary, very rich place in which drawings are used. And so they make for a really great place to then, you know, discuss the structures that are involved. Um, and uh, that's how I would largely situate it now is, is largely, I study what I call visual language, which is then uh, mm -hmm. the systems that are used in the creation of drawings, because drawings differ across cultures and across different patterns. And those patterns are systems just the same way as we use systems in speech uh, to communicate. And just like we have spoken languages, we then have different visual languages. And so I study visual language and visual languages. And uh, you mentioned a study of 300, was it 350? Yeah. Comments? Yeah. Yeah. So I imagine there's a great joy in your work and yet also oh. a great, uh, it sounds very intensive as well uh, an intensive joy <laughs> that is that, yes yes uh both of those things are true um yeah i mean i'm very passionate about what i do um i you know essentially took what i was most passionate about and had these ideas about since i was a child and then ran with that as an academic and as a you know i've also i'm also a comic creator and have been for many many years um and uh just, you know the longer than I've been an academic. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I really love it, but I think also I just, part of it is the intensity is just my personality. I'm fairly intense about things that I'm passionate about. Um, and so, you know, you you run full steam ahead with it. Um, and, and an example of that is, you know, this project where we analyzed 350 plus comics uh, from these 13, 12, 13 countries. Um, you know, we were interested in cross-cultural differences and things like that. And uh, and we indeed found really interesting findings. Uh, but I didn't want to stop there because 13 countries is very small compared to the whole world. And mm -hmm. naturally, we're, you know, I didn't, well, not purposefully excluding anybody, but it by nature of having that selection was, you know, limiting. So our current project is what's called the Tintin Project. Uh, mm -hmm. And there we're, we're analyzing the structures of over a thousand comics from uh, worldwide. So it, literally as many countries as we possibly can, uh, we're currently up to, I think, 135 uh, countries. Uh, and I'm just trying to fill in the map at this point. There's only a couple, there's some areas left, but I'm doing the best I can to fill it in. And it's been a five, it's a five year project that we're uh, on year three of. So no, we're in the, yeah, we're, no, in the middle of year four, God. Um, and, um, and yeah, we're, we've been gathering all this data so that we can talk about what the patterns are that are found across comics around the world, uh, and whether, you know, there are say, uh, regional varieties of visual languages. So is the visual languages used in Asia different than that used in Europe and the Americas, or are they visual languages that transcend, you know, cultural boundaries? Like, you know, if there's an American visual language that is what superhero comics are drawn in, what I typically call Kirbyan, um, and there's a Japanese visual language like they're drawn in manga, 
you know, those don't have to be restricted to any sort of boundaries. So people who draw like manga from the United States are drawing in Japanese visual language. They're just not in Japan. Um, in the same way that people in America can learn to speak Japanese, um, even if they aren't in Japan, because the language itself doesn't have those sorts of regional boundaries. Uh, and then the question also becomes things like, well, to what degree is the Japanese visual language used outside Japan reflecting the structures of the Japanese visual language used in Japan? You know, are, are they, do you have, you know, native level uh, uh, structures outside of Japan, for example? So, um, yeah, and I have a whole team that works with me to do this research at this point. I'm you mentioned the, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. How, how large is your team? I'm just curious. Um, let's see, I have two PhD students. I have uh, a postdoc who just left, who designed software for us to be able to do this uh, analysis. I have another postdoc who just started this year. Uh, I have uh, several visiting PhDs who are also associated with me. So there's three of them. Uh, one's about to become a postdoc. Um, so I have, you know, a fairly large team. And I have some uh, actual additional staff and assistants who work with me, a lab manager. And so I th I would say all told, there's about 10 to 15 people who've been working That's with me right. on this project, plus many collaborators who are scholars from around the world uh, mm -hmm. who've contributed in various ways uh, and comic companies and creators who have uh, given us books to analyze from literally all over the world. And uh, we have donations of maybe about, I think from 80 different co uh, companies and creators uh, who've given us comics. So it's, uh, we're very grateful for the, uh, the support and for the, you know, the collaboration and the, the spirit of, you know, uh, community, community uh, efforts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, no doubt, that project will be, has been, and will continue to be generative, uh, given the yeah. the breadth of, of how you publish and share. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so our, our idea is we're going to start writing papers about the data in September. And eventually, once the data set is kind of capped off, the whole data set will be made available for openly to researchers. Uh, and I'm hopefully, as with the one, the data set in Patterns of Comics, I'd like to design a website that people can kind of search through with the data a little bit and be able to get a sense of different patterns and things that are involved in it. Um, uh, uh, but those are things we have to still have to figure out how to do that properly. <laughs> are you still actively creating comics? Uh, I am. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, am actually the, the, the act of comic creation right now is that I've been working for many years on a graphic novel about my research as well. Um, Beautiful. and that, uh, is aimed for two years from now to be done. Um, we'll, we'll see if I hit my mark, but it's, uh, basically a 300 page graphic novel about visual communication and the structure of language and, and, uh, visual languages. And the, forward to that. and the linguistic structure and, and cognition of visual languages. It is a comic about comics. It is a comic about comics, technically. Love it, love it. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm gonna I'm going to now give you a chance to sort of share for whatever audience members happen by, if that's okay. Sure. So uh, I'm projecting, and of course it's. The one of the things I enjoy about the podcast and sharing videos is their open access. As I mentioned, I'm I'm a fan yeah. of that. So I can't hit everybody, but uh, if I'm an educator who happens to be watching right now, what's what's something you might share from your work and research for the educator community? Sure. So um, I have done quite a bit of work with uh, comics and education, and looking at what the scientific literature there indicates. Um, the one thing I would say is it absolutely indicates that comics can be beneficial for learning across uh, a variety of uh, topics. Uh, however, it's not a magic bullet and it doesn't, it doesn't come with for free to sort mm -hmm. of say. So I think a lot of the treatment by people is to believe that images, particularly sequential images, uh, require no learning. You just understand them by virtue of seeing. They're easy to understand. And so when you add pictures to text, the text is the real substance. And the pictures is just there to be a quote unquote visual support is a, a common term that I hear. Um, and that's just simply not true about graphics and visuals. Um, the visuals also need to be learned in order to understand 
how, how you know what's what they're communicating. And so if you're using comics in a classroom, for example, um, the students need to understand the text. They also need to understand the visuals and they also need to understand the relationship between the text and the visuals. And those are all things they have to learn. Um, some of those students may get it really easily because they've had exposure and practice with comics. Um, and typically what you see in these studies, and we're doing kind of some review papers on this just to confirm whether this is true or not, is often what you see is comics end up being really beneficial in educational contexts, especially for the people who already have proficiency in reading comics. Uh -huh. They're the ones that get this really big benefit. For the people who are not proficient in comics, you don't see that gain. And you might actually see that it's worse for them because it's essentially asking them to learn through a, a language that they're not proficient in. Um, so there are benefits above and beyond like textbooks and things like that, like regular style, you know, either text alone or textbook style things. Comics do have an advantage, but they only get that advantage if people are proficient already. So you need to be essentially like, my advocacy then is, well, use them in the context of education to both educate and to help gain that proficiency that will let them then get that benefit from them. So you can't just assume that people have uh, the ability to understand comics for free um, or that it's going to be some magic bullet. Because if you do that, you might find, in fact, that you get disappointed. Like, oh my God, students suddenly don't understand this very well. And, you know, it, suddenly it's worse than it was for some people, um, you know, and then you might, it might be really off-putting, but you, you have to put that in the context of people needing to get proficient. So um, I think that's the main thing that I would tell educators is yes, they can be great, but they also are, you know, they, they need to be, you know, learned how to be understood at the same time. I love that intentionality. Absolutely. And it also speaks to the role of the teacher in deciding the materials to use and how to use them and modeling use Absolutely. of of any yeah. text, really. Absolutely. There, I would also say there's kind of two different ways in which we can think about using comics in education. One is that you use comics like the sociocultural objects, the like, oh, let's have Spider-Man as a you know book that we read, or uh, we're learning about the Holocaust, so let's read Mouse, or um, any of these sorts of things, which is like, let's engage with actual comics for lessons that we're doing. Then that's perfectly fine. You know, let's learn about authoritarianism through reading superhero comics or something, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all of that is perfectly valid use of comics and education. But that's a little different than, for example, using combinations of text and image in order to educate. And in that context, that would be, for example, if you have well, instead of having a textbook style book about biology or whatever, you have a, what we would call graphic novel about biology. It's still a textbook, but it's just has a different formatting. That's very different in its kind of character as an educational tool than using existing, say, comics in a classroom setting. Both of them are valid, but it's also worth remembering which one is being used uh, and how. Like which of those two things is is the intent behind the education? Um, uh, because they're not the same thing ultimately. Um, now you can advocate for both of them, which is great, and I I do. Uh, but it's also it's important to know which one you're using and how. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, what about the the young scholars, the high school students, the undergrads with whom I work? Any any message for that particular? demographic or set of demographics about your work uh well um i think part of it is that at, at, with younger generations especially they are able to you know advocate on behalf of themselves for what sorts of materials they are comfortable with um, a lot of you know the use of say comics in education uh comes from people who are passionate about these things um, and many students are often sort of denigrated for their reading habits by people who disagree with those passions, let's say. So, um, you know, people looking at, say, reading comics is not real reading or something like that, which is just 
nonsense, I can say. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Um, and for st the student side, you know, if that's what they like to read and they do have that fluency, by all means, they should push back against people who hold these erroneous beliefs. Um, and the more it's also motivated from the students, you know, the more it's going to gain traction as well. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I don't have data on it quite, but yeah, but one would presume that there's an increasing fluency by age that younger people would be indeed have this proficiency more and more. Now I can't speak to that because I, I don't have the numbers on that per se, but, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I, and, and especially I would say just people, regardless of age, if you're passionate about these sorts of things, by all means, you should be, uh, pushing it. Uh, in in the context that you want to see it. Absolutely. And fluency is one of those things for uh, folks out there that want to to check out the information that's in the research community on fluency. I would recommend Tim Rosinski, uh, who continues to advocate for fluency, even in uh, high school, middle school, junior high school, whatever it happens to be. Um, we, we hope that fluency continues to grow. But yeah. um, it's not always the case, and sometimes it's because the access to fluency building materials are not as uh, open and available. Right. And um, so I'm noting our this might be the That's first of two talks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so last question, and then we can talk about any uh, potential resources that we want sure. to mention again. And that is for the comics creator community who happens by to to hear this talk, um, including or not including Todd McFarlane. Any message for for uh, <laughs> that particular community? Uh, yeah. So I think, first of all, situated within a visual language context, you know, Comic creators are the you know, quote unquote speakers of visual languages. Um, and there's a reason why it's a community. It's because languages are situated within a com within communities, right? Um, in the case of the comics community broadly, there might be several language communities that are all mushed together. There's like, so the manga community is essentially not exclusively, but often, you know, Japanese visual language uh, community, and then there's the Caribbean community, and sometimes you have crossover or a, a, a broader uh, uh, readership or bilinguals or however you want to phrase it. Um, so to those people, I would say, you know, certainly it's it's worth also, I think, uh, emphasizing the linguistic aspects of this as a system. Um, you know, there's a lot that's talked about how people are undervaluing comic artists these days, especially, um, and the work that goes into it. Um, and I think part of that is also reflected in there is a proficiency here. You have to learn a system. It's not just like drawing is not just you look at something and you articulate what you see. Drawing is I would actually say that's not at all what drawing is, uh, which implies that there's nothing, no system there really drawing is about the establishment of a system of patterns that you build up with a vocabulary and a grammar that has its own uh, structured patterns. And it's the learning of those patterns that makes you quote unquote able to draw. So um, embracing this systematicity is I think good. I think there's a lot of pushback to the notion that there is anything systematic about drawing in the first place because it somehow makes it seem more cold and less creative when i don't think we'd ever say that speaking is doesn't have some sort of creativity to it um you know the creativity comes from how you're using that system and i think embracing the fact that it has that regularity to it is a good thing um and it has built into it this sense of community which it doesn't if all drawing is just one's own, you know, quote unquote, artistic vision of the world, where it's you as an isolated person, it doesn't highlight the connectedness that you get to other people. And I think all that's very important and worth leaning into. So I would say, that, you know, yes, there are rules <laughs> to some degree, um, and that's what we're studying. Um, and it's okay to acknowledge that and embrace that. And it doesn't mean that using patterns and systematic things makes anybody less creative. Um, yeah, and that's okay, I think. And it might be a poorly crafted metaphor, but I'm thinking about inflection, dialect, tone, um, 
even intonation and um, accent. And so within that system, just, just acknowledging that there's a system doesn't yeah. necessarily imply that a person doesn't have a voice or style. Absolutely. Uh, because uh, as you're talking about taking in images and representing what's on what's in the world on the page, there's a there's a processing system there. There's an interpretive system. Yeah, but I would say that's not even what drawing is. It's not even that you look at stuff and draw. It. It's that you are building up an inventory of graphic representations and patterns, and that's what drawing is: is building up this vocabulary of patterns, not. Uh, not interpreting the world that you see. Now you might use those patterns to do that, mm -hmm. but we also do that with uh, speaking, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see that, I see that. All right, uh, which is an ironic phrase given what we were just talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'll mention the Visual Language Lab, who understands comics, the visual language of comics. And you said you had a book coming out this fall as well. Uh, yeah, another so to follow. Be, uh, yeah, December will be the patterns of comics. June will be a multimodal language faculty. And uh, probably maybe 2025 will be my graphic novel. Um, so, uh, but uh, more, more info on that to come. Uh, and my Twitter uh, is at least for now still, where I often talk about these things. And that's uh, visual underscore linguist. Yes, I'll, I'll tag it and uh, also tag you when I share this as well. Perfect. Thanks so much. And I would be happy to come back and do some more. Uh, Thank you, you so much. Additional things to discuss. Uh, any other questions or concerns while we're, or while we're at it? Um, you know, I, I think that that just about covers uh, the first round, but always, always glad to talk with you. Always glad to yeah. share about your work. I, I enjoy it. I look forward to digging into the things that are to come. And I, I'm always challenged by it as well in my thinking about comics and visuals. And uh, for anyone out there that wants to really explore this topic, I would recommend your your resources. Well, thanks so much. That's really kind of you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Great.